All right. Criminals make mistakes. They travel to nice places. A lot of law enforcement attribute, attribution is left of the boom, which I love that phrase, and report crimes quickly. Um, some of the many tips that we heard. Um, so thank you, Tanya, Michael, and Judy. That was a fantastic session. What we're going to do right now is um, <clears throat> Uh, we're going to have our next two flash talks. And our flash talks, as a reminder, um, folks have written commission papers for this symposium that are going to be published in January. And they're going to give their five minute elevator pitches on this. So our next to do flash talks are Maggie Bruner and Stephen Cobb. Um, I'm sorry, Margaret Bruner. I don't know why I said Maggie. Margaret is the program director. Um, Homeland Security and Public Safety Division of the National Governors Association, and she will be talking about state and local level efforts on cybercrime enforcement. Stephen is a retired information security professional and is now an independent researcher and will be presenting a few minutes on his paper on the need for better cybercrime metrics. So um, come on up. I guess it is Maggie. It is, it is Maggie. I was right the first time. Thank you, sir. So again, I'm Maggie Brunner with the National Governors Association, and um, I am one of the authors in the symposium, so pleased to share with you my papers about. Uh, a couple of statistics to frame at the topic of my paper. So we know from our friends at Third Way that less than 1% of cyber criminals see enforcement. We also know there are 18,000 law enforcement agencies in the United States, the bulk of whom are state and local. So really the crux of my argument is this, if you want to raise the less than 1% in enforcement, you need to leverage the 18,000. Um, so I would say too, there's some great capabilities that do exist in the state and local agencies. We have some of our friends here today, but I'll give you a good example from this summer. There was a slew of ransomware attacks in Louisiana on school districts, and we know that one of the school districts reported that to the Louisiana State Police early, they were able to do a forensic investigation, they disseminated indicators of compromise, and they were able to identify five additional parishes who had been targeted but had not yet had their data encrypted yet. So they were able to prevent it from being encrypted. And those are the types of success stories that we're seeing when state and locals get involved. State and local agencies are also very well positioned to handle computer-enabled crime. So we talked a little bit about romance scams earlier, um, computer-enabled fraud, um, things like swatting that are a particular concern. That's really in the purview of state and local agencies. Um, I think a lot of times the public isn't aware of the fact that within federal law enforcement agencies, the threshold by which they open an investigation is pretty high. Um, so if we're talking about, and that makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, the federal agencies really need to prioritize the resources on the most important cases. But with the human element, if it doesn't meet that threshold, you know, if you are, for example, a large corporation, you might be able to absorb a loss of $50,000. But for private individuals, for small businesses, for municipal government, um, that could really be life-changing. So we gotta get state and locals in the game, that's my argument. Uh, in the paper I lay out eight recommendations to do so, and I'll just give you a little teaser for some of them here today. One is really kind of bolstering those task force models. So we know that task forces are wonderful things for state and local agencies. Um, they enable hands-on training, technical assistance, uh, they enable state and locals to get access to some great databases, and also to give them that multi-jurisdictional reach that they really need to be effective in this space. But the FBI cybercrime task forces are nowhere as near robust as JTTF's HIDA models like that. So it really is about prioritizing those models that we know work. The other thing I would say too is that you know, at the state and local space, legislators and governors, et cetera, really need to look at their cybercrime laws. In a lot of instances, state took federal CIFA and they married that with their really old computer crime and computer codes and it wasn't always a perfect marriage. So we're at a time right now where states really need to be assessing any potential gaps, particularly with regards to emerging tech or emerging threats. Another quick recommendation too, uh, reducing the victim pool. 
So we know traditionally in crime that this is something that law enforcement does all the time. It's not just about investigating, it's also about how do we reduce crime on the front end. So if you think about a law enforcement officer potentially doing a security assessment of a building to try to reduce something like burglary, that's something we all agree is a great use of resources. So state and local governments are particularly well positioned for this as well because they're very close to the people. And we've already seen that um, occurring across the states. So right across the river in New Jersey, they have something called the, um, the NJ Kick. It's a cyber integration center. And as individuals, you can sign up for bulletins. It provides cyber threats in real layman's terms to try to really get at individuals and small businesses. We also know that there are some governors out there who are taking their cybersecurity task forces, employing public-private mo partnership models where they send out private sector volunteers into the communities, community centers, schools, and places like that to really talk about reducing the victim pool on the front end. So in summary, I would say, you know, please read my paper. I lay out a bunch more recommendations for state and local. It's really important to get them in the game. Um, we are a country that was founded upon principles of federalism. And it's really important to understand when we're talking about cybercrime enforcement, we don't just mean the FBI and the Secret Service. They do great work, but we really, because of the decentralized nature of our government, need to be talking about everybody in a whole of government approach. Thank you. So, uh, my name is Stephen Cobb. My paper is Advancing Accurate and Objective Cybercrime Metrics, and that's how you can reach me. Um, I used to work for a security company, ESET. I'm no longer there. I spent my last eight years as a security, senior security researcher there. So, I tried to bring a, an industry perspective to this, but also provide in my paper a lot of the references you need to, to really drill down into the cybercrime metrics problem. But I believe even a flash talk should begin with some humor. So uh, I'm going to make a joke, if this works, um, about evidence-based policymaking. So evidence-based policymaking, which is what we're really about here, we want to use data to do policy right. We say S is the size of the problem, Q is a measure of the resources devoted to reducing S, Increasing Q by percent U will reduce S by amount A over a period of time T. All right, so we got that. Unfortunately, this means when it comes to cybercrime policy, we don't know squat. And, and, and this is sadly truer than it should be. Uh, things aren't like bleak, and, and, and I'll hopefully give you some points at the end which will cheer you up uh, to end on a hopeful note, but uh, let's, let's take a look at probably a, an encapsulation of, of the situation, right? I, I sort of took this statement and others have made statements like this um, through the proceedings today, that until there are accepted measures and benchmarks for the incidents and damage caused by computer-related crime, it will remain a guess whether we are spending enough resources to invest or protect against such crimes. Great statement, 15 years ago, in a terrific paper, by the way, uh, which I referenced from Susan Brenner 15 years ago. So, so that's one of the frustrations. People have been working for the last 15 years on this. Some great work has been done, but we still don't have those accepted measures and benchmarks for incidents and damage caused by crime in cyberspace. Here are some of the things that have happened over the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, and they're not going to go through all the acronyms, but just to sort of put this in perspective, when you look at traditional crime, and we've talked quite a bit about that, uh, traditional crime, what I would call meat-space crime as opposed to cybercrime, uh, where the crime is actually happening in the real world, it looks like governments have all the data. You know, they can tell you how many burglaries there were last year. So if they can do that, why can't they tell you how many ransomware attacks there were last year? And unfortunately, it's a, it's a trick question to ask that because we don't have good data on actual meat space crime. It looks like we do, but we're not getting complete reporting. And 
we're not getting all of those 18,000 people reporting in the same way, in a consistent way, with enough information about the context of the crime in order to really get accurate statistics. So there's been, in the last uh, decades or so, drops in various kinds of crimes, statistically, but we're beginning to think maybe they haven't dropped and maybe they've moved over into the world of cyberspace. So if we say there's been a crime drop, can we really say that with any accuracy? If we're going to spend a lot of money on fighting cybercrime, how can we say accurately that we've reduced it by spending the money that we spend on it? So I focus a lot in the paper on a tremendous amount of work which was done by the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, a project called Modernizing the Nation's Crime Statistics. And there are two reports put out, uh, one in 2016, one in 2018, which really come up with some great suggestions. And the first is to carry on enhancing the incident-based reporting, the NIBRs, which you've heard mentioned, um, enhanced victim surveys. There have been some great victim surveys done to capture that dark crime figure, which doesn't get reported, uh, but it gets discovered if you ask people. And so just to summarize, therefore recommendations, are to enable incident-based reporting to reach critical mass and address cybercrime, increase scope and timeliness of cybercrime victimization surveys, create a new cybercrime measurement clearinghouse function to mine all government sources of metrics relevant to cybercrime, and then something which uh, other people have talked about is a clearinghouse for all that other information. For example, in the cybercrime industry, we have a tremendous amount of information of people who are calling their security software companies saying, I've got a problem, let's try and make a space for that information to be shared so that we can reap the benefit of that as well. So, I encourage you to read the paper when it comes out and I appreciate your attention. Our flash talkers have been amazing. Uh, we're gonna take, uh, yeah, let's, We're going to take about five minutes or so to kind of reconfigure the stage. Then we're going to have a, our international panel, which is going to be absolutely fantastic and really, really illuminating. So I encourage you to all stay for that. Back, take a short break back in five.